pesky web webcam that doesn't want to sit in one place. So maybe that's fun to watch. I'm not sure. Um, uh, as Ken said, my name is Frederick Emmerich, um, and I'm looking forward to working with you this week. This week, you see I'm wearing headphones, which is a little bit strange for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to change that a little bit um, so you can see me like I'm not coming from outer space. Uh, we're going to get right into the material today. Uh, you, I'll, I'll go through my presentation and uh, we will ask you to read the chapter from which this presentation comes uh, before the next class uh, and also the second chapter. That way we'll get onto a cycle so that you're reading, uh, reading material before the presentation actually happens, which will help you with questions and that sort of thing. I do want to say, in terms of my presentation style, um, I don't usually do what I would consider straight lectures when I'm in a classroom with people. Uh, I like to discuss things with people. So I'll, I'll do a series of three or five minute uh, lecturettes and then, um, and then engage in some discussion, some conversation with students. I tried that a bit last year when we were running this class and it was a little bit tricky uh, because of the, I think, I think because of the um, style of the, or, or the, 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 the technology that we're using only lets one person talk at a time and it's a little bit cumbersome to switch back and forth between people. So, um, We'll see how things go. I, uh, my natural style is conversational. Um, my, I'm, I'm not somebody who lectures and lectures usually, uh, but, but um, uh, we'll, look for, we'll look for a balance. I try to build in moments for people to ask questions. This is all uh, a prelude to say, anytime I'm making a presentation, uh, feel free, please ask questions, use, use the chat, uh, use the chat to ask questions, um, or if you want to make a comment, feel free to uh, to post something uh, into the into the chat box as well. I try to watch it as I'm speaking, um, so hopefully that will work. Now, before I begin the main presentation, can everybody hear me? Okay, am I too loud, too soft? I notice when I speak here, uh, I'm going a little into the red line. I don't know if that means I'm too loud. Okay, great. Audio levels, okay. Anytime you have trouble with audio levels or anything else, please let me know. Okay, so the course, our, uh, our course is addressing uh, media and society, and our textbook addresses uh, media and culture. Uh, a lot of times these are dealt with, uh, society and culture are understood as almost the same thing. Uh, for our purposes, we can, we can treat them that way. Uh, culture is a concept that's, that's a bit more broad than society. Society is uh, addressing um, relationships between people, uh, uh, people have. And, and for, for anthropologists and people who study culture, a culture is a sort of a more fundamental concept. I guess we could think of it as culture, uh, culture is the base of meaning uh, on which we create societies. In a way, it's hard for us to think of uh, people either constructing either culture or society because we're, we're born into it. Um, we're born into a world of meaning that exists before our arrival. We have some opportunity to engage in that world, to have an impact on it, um, but but it's very difficult for us to think of individuals as uh, as having a, a significant uh, ability to change culture 
Um, let's just keep that that idea in mind um, as we as we proceed through the course material. I'm, I'm sure it will come up from time to time. Uh, now, I hope everybody can see, if you click on presentation, there's a slide that says Understanding Media and Culture, uh, our first slide, and I will uh, use these slides to uh, help us through the, uh, the lecture. Now I have to remember. How to get rid of picture. Ken, how do I get rid of the little box that says uh, page one of 14 and is kind of in the way of the slide for me? Okay, there we are. Sorry about that. There will be a couple of technical issues, I'm sure, as we move forward. Okay, so we're dealing with mass communication. Um, when we talk about mass communication, we're talking about uh, communication that's transmitted to large segments of the population. The word mass, um, the word mass refers to um, something of substance, of weight. Uh, in, in relationship to what we're talking about, mass means large numbers of people. We're talking about groups of people that are too, too big to uh, communicate with face-to-face. -face. Uh, in other words, sometimes you'll hear the term mass society. When we talk about mass societies, we're talking about societies that have developed technologically and culturally uh, so that uh, so that the people uh, the people who are part of society are only connected to one another ultimately through uh, mass media and mass communication now tell me I'd, I'd like us to brainstorm a little bit and this is this is one of the things I like to do with the class so what for you what is communication what other words can we substitute for communication? If we talk about mass communication as communication transmitted to large segments of the population, we're making a little bit of a, a logical, a, we're, we're creating what's called a logical fallacy. We've, we've defined our term mass communication using one of the terms itself communication transmitted to large segments of the population. What other words could we use to substitute in this case for communication? What else could we what else could we say that might help us understand the idea of mass communication? Any ideas? Go ahead and put it in the chat if you can think of anything. Okay, Jisoo, media, uh, media transmitted to large segments of the population. Um, any examples? What do you mean by media? Okay, uh, Viola Wu, uh, change message. Okay, good. <clears throat>
uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, CC Chin uh, connection. I, I like that connection. Um, I think in, in terms of the way we understand mass society, uh, mass communication is it's absolutely it's a form of connection between people. Now, you notice in the definition we've been given, communication transmitted to large segments of the population. Uh, the image is of something given to someone. In other words, sent out. Now, now that makes sense for many of our forms of mass communication. When we talk about mass communication, um, we're talking about communication through uh, print technologies, newspapers, magazines, books. Uh, we're talking about broadcast technologies like television and radio. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, we're talking about film, uh, recorded media like uh, CDs, DVDs. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, we're talking about uh, internet technologies. Uh, any form of communication that reaches broad numbers of people. Now, most of those technologies are technologies that. Uh, until recently were, were one-way technologies in which communication was mostly a one-way process. Uh, somebody who controlled a broadcast, uh, a, a, a broadcast uh, system or, or a, uh, a printing press had the opportunity to, to produce information and deliver it to people. And a lot of our thinking about mass communication, even though uh, even though communication has changed quite a bit uh, in the last 30 years or so with the internet, uh, we still, in talking about mass communication, our definitions still draw on this idea of communication as being a thing, a thing that's transmitted. And I think it's, it's very important to understand communication less as a thing and more as a process. Uh, 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 an activity in which people engage, um, connect with one another, and hopefully come to understand uh, understand one another. Now that's um, that that you know, can also be transmission of ideas. I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, also to to um, to address the question of transmission versus uh, transmission transmission versus um, communication uh, but but this is an idea that we'll, we'll deal with over time okay so a medium we, we, we break down our, our definitions a little bit we're talking about mass media a medium when we talk about a medium in the singular now sometimes a media uh, uh, a, a medium, in this case, is, is an instrument or a means of transmission, a means of sending uh, information, sending ideas. And, and uh, this, this understanding of what mass media are has, has a lot to do with that, that deeper understanding of the process of mass communication um, that we have. When we talk about media in the plural, we're talking about many different, uh, uh, many different instruments or means of, of uh, transmission of communication. So when we talk about mass media, we're talking about uh, instruments or means of transmission that are designed to reach large audiences. Okay. Again, looking at some of the key technologies, the, the technologies that were around in the 20th century, uh, broadcast, print, uh, recorded media, um, telephone, telegraph. Uh, these were uh, these were instruments that were, um, <coughs> with the exception of telephone and telegraph, these were these were technologies that um, were almost exclusively used to reach large audiences. At least at least as they developed as industries. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's important to our understanding of what 
mass media are. You know, again, with the internet, things have changed so somewhat. We use the internet both as a means of communication that helps us engage with large audiences and as a means of communication that helps us communicate uh, individually with people. All right, let's consider another piece of the puzzle that we're dealing with today. We're talking about what culture is. Uh, Clifford Geertz. Clifford Geertz is a, a I believe he's still, uh, an anthropologist um, who has dealt uh, extensively with with the uh, idea of culture, what culture is, uh, how culture helps us construct meaning. Uh, so he tells us. Culture is a historically transmitted pattern of meetings embodied in symbols, a system of inherited conceptions expressed in symbolic forms by means of which men communicate, perpetuate, and develop their knowledge about and their attitudes toward life. In other words, Culture is the expressed and shared values, attitudes, beliefs, and practices of a social group, organization, or institution. Now, this, this second quote uh, expresses somewhat the idea that I was starting to get at earlier in the lecture. Um, when we talk about <coughs> culture, we're talking about something deeper and bigger than just society, uh, society itself. Uh, culture in a sense, culture is the medium within which society develops. It's the environment in which uh, society develops. And that, that environment is made up of these shared values, attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Uh, sometimes we can say what those values, attitudes, beliefs, and practices are. Sometimes it's a little difficult for us to quite put our finger on what those things are or how those may differ from one society to another society. Uh, this is a challenge of trying to understand, uh, trying to understand a concept that is intended to help us, uh, to help us get a grasp on the medium in which we're embedded culture. <clears throat> okay, another important term for us as we, as we proceed through the course is the idea of cultural period. Um, for our purposes, a cultural period is a time marked by a particular way of understanding the world through culture and technology. What does this mean for us? Um, it means that, um, that technology, and in our case particularly communication technologies, are both um, tools that help us to communicate, to engage with others. Um, but they're, they're, they're also, more than being tools, they become part of the medium of culture itself. Uh, there's a significant difference in, in a culture, in being embedded in a culture in which there's an opportunity um, to understand, to, to, to visualize what's happening on the other side of the world or on other planets. Um, and living in a culture where uh, you really can only know about what's happening in other places, uh, if you haven't seen them for yourself, you can only know through spoken word, through what people tell you. Uh, and, and so if we think about it in these terms, we can, we can, understand, uh, we can understand communication technologies uh, as, as fundamental to the development of, of, of culture. Now, technology changes over time. 
as, as human beings learn to do things differently, as they learn to develop, as they develop new practices, uh, new understandings of the world around them, they're, they're able to, to develop more and more sophisticated tools, and that includes tools for communication. Um, people who study mass media, mass communication, uh, pay lots of attention to different uh, cultural periods that are marked by the dominance of different communication technologies. So as we go through this course, uh, we'll be looking at uh, we'll be looking at periods marked off by the arrival of print technologies, for example, um, the arrival of uh, telegraph, telephone, um, uh, recorded media, uh, photography, uh, and so on. Uh, as we look at as we look at communication, we can see uh, we can see the periods in which particular technologies, significant technologies, emerge uh, as as signposts, as signals that help us mark out particular cultural periods. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll be emphasizing that throughout the course is how how we understand uh, when we when we're focused on on uh, media and communication, uh, we can mark off particular cultural periods based on, uh, based on the uh, arrival or dominance of particular communication technology. So a few cultural periods we could, we could consider. Um, the Middle Ages, the 5th to the 15th century, uh, in this period, Technology and communication were placed uh, in the hands of authorities like the king and the church who could dictate what was true. This was a period uh, before the advent of uh, the Gutenberg press, the, the arrival of, of uh, print technologies. There were, uh, during this period, there were books, there was writing, of course, uh, but there wasn't a system of mass producing the written word uh, or mass producing printed te texts. Um, so uh, communicating uh, through, through media was not a mass process. It was still a, a, a very selective process in this period of time. Um, the, the ability to read and write was quite limited in this period of time. Books were not prevalent. Books were very expensive, uh, limited to uh, highly educated and wealthy people. Um, and uh, most people got their uh, information about what was going on in the world around them through word of mouth. So that's one cultural period that we'll deal with. A uh, next cultural period, the Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance was the period in which the Gutenberg printing press, and we will look at this in detail uh, later on, but the Gutenberg printing press uh, was a technology that allowed people to, to mass produce pages that could be used for newspapers, books, other things. So uh, instead, of, instead of having to produce each page individually by hand, which had previously, in the Middle Ages, been the method of producing texts. Uh, uh, pages could be produced, duplicate pages could be produced over and over and over again. Now certainly by, by today's standards, this was a very slow process, but it was a huge revolution <clears throat> in uh, technology, uh, communication technology. It marked off a new cultural period <clears throat> and it helped to promote things like uh, literacy, uh, uh, the uh, somewhat democratization of, of access to ideas uh, and so on. Uh, this is the age in which the idea of seeking truth through reason 
uh, developed and the development of, of the scientific method. Uh, and these are things that are uh, largely connected to the spread of information that was enabled by the creation of um, uh, mass print technology through the Gutenberg Press. Uh, modernity, the early modern era, uh, is uh, spreading the, from the 15th to the 18th century. Now there's quite a bit of overlap um, with the previous the Renaissance era. It's during the Renaissance that the Gutenberg press itself develops and leads us into this modern era. Literacy expands and develops. This is the age of exploration and the spread of capitalism, um, the rise of nation states. Now this gets very complex and of course covers, covers many, many academic disciplines. Uh, we treat it very lightly here, but, but it is important for us to understand this as a, a transition of, of cultural periods that's connected to transitions of communication technologies, which is where the concern lies for uh, communication scholars. The late modern era, the 18th to the 20th century, is when the Industrial Revolution occurs. Uh, the American and French revolutions appeared in this period. Steam power developed. The internal combustion engine was in invented. Uh, manufacturing developed uh, and pushed, uh, pushed agriculture aside as the dominant means of, of uh, uh, economic development. Uh, these technologies uh, combined with uh, combined with communication technologies made more efficient the process of print, uh, of, of print media. Um, and there, was, there were moves to develop other kinds of media as well uh, during this period. So um, uh, there was uh, development of the rise in this period of books and newspapers, which required even more than just the Gutenberg Press itself um, the, the rise of technologies that helped speed the process of printing uh, increased the influence on the presence of print technologies as mass media during this period. Postmodernity is, is uh, 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 oh, and I'm sorry, also during the modern period we see development of of uh, other technologies, uh, uh, broadcast and and, uh, and and other technologies as well, which lead us into this era of postmodernity. Uh, you may have heard the term postmodernity in other uh, in other contexts in your university class. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of the details uh, about it at this point. Uh, for our purposes. Um, the, the postmodern era, in terms of communication technology, the postmodern era connects to the expansion of broadcasting, the expansion of uh, media that bring people more directly into contact with more things uh, in the world. And uh, the world changes from one in, from one in which uh, we understand the world mostly through what happens in front of us uh, with the benefit of ideas that come through other media um, and, and turns into a world in, in which we're immersed in, in mass media uh, and mass media, we could argue that mass media are the dominant way that we learn about the world around us. That, that the extent to which we're exposed to mass media um, that, that give us a sense of uh, connection with the real world, uh, with a moving, um, uh, audible world, uh, can, can sometimes drown out the experiences that we have in, in, in the immediate world around us. So uh, the idea of postmodernity, the period of post the postmodern era, uh, is 
that there's a rise in uh, skepticism about um, about the world, about um, the values that we're presented with, uh, about the things that people say are important and meaningful in our lives. Um, there's a sense of fragmentation of things being uh, separated and, and not making sense uh, together. Um, and for many people, this, this means uh, a rise in, in the idea that there is no objective truth. Uh, this era is, is closely associated with the rise of electronic media and what we call an information economy, um, an economy no longer, no longer based primarily on manufacturing of physical goods, uh, but an economy in which the processing of information, uh, of uh, informational goods, uh, film, television, uh, software, data, uh, uh, those kinds of those kinds of things become more significant uh, uh, culturally and economically uh, than uh, than the um, than manufactured goods. So this is an idea that we'll we'll also uh, look at as we move forward. One important concept that um, that we'll we'll see throughout the term also is the idea of convergence. Now, <clears throat> lots of different scholars, uh, communication scholars, talk about the idea of convergence. The word converge means coming together at a point. When things converge, they're they're separate, and they come together and they meet at a particular point. That's what, what the word convergence uh, means in English. Um, Henry Jenkins is a, is a communication scholar who has um, built a career largely around considering uh, the idea of convergence. There are many other people who have dealt with it as well. Our text deals mostly with, uh, with Jenkins' idea of, of convergence. Um, when we're talking about media. If we talk about convergence, there, there are lots of different ways that we can understand convergence. Right? Um, there's what we call economic convergence. Uh, economic convergence means um, when things that have been economically separated in the past start to come together. Uh, what does this look like in the real world? Uh, it looks like, uh, for example, uh, for example, in the motion, the, the motion picture industry, the early motion picture industry, um, there were people who came to dominate the industry who realized that it made sense for them uh, economically not just to control the process of making films but also to control the process of distributing films and of showing films in theaters. Um, in other words, uh, one company would own not, not, just, not just a production company that made films and sold them to people, uh, but they would also own, <clears throat> uh, own the channels of distribution that brought films to theaters, and they would also own the theaters themselves. Um, if you visit cities in the United States, still today you can you can uh, find cities that have uh, theaters with names like RKO or Fox, um, the names of uh, the names of major uh, film production companies, and this is an example of. Um, this is an example of this kind of convergence where companies tried to own all the facets of um, of delivering films uh, to uh, to people and and, and controlling the, uh, as much of the economic relationship as possible. Um, 
organic convergence. Now, this, this idea of organic convergence is one that's more particular to Jenkins. Economic convergence is one that many people deal with. Um, Jenkins deals with the idea of organic convergence, which he uses the example of, <laughs> excuse me, of multitasking. Um, organic convergence, in his sense, uh, refers, for example, uh, when I'm uh, when I'm on the internet, I have access to um, uh, to many to many different. Uh, to, to many different kinds of media. I, have, I can access video, audio, text, um, still images. Uh, I can mix things, move them around. And from Jenkins' perspective, uh, this kind of convergence, which is focused on the experience of the individual, uh, is very important in our understanding of the world. Uh, and you could relate this back to the idea of postmodernism. Uh, the idea that uh, in a world in which we're inundated with images, uh, we have the opportunity through this organic convergence, we have the opportunity to uh, remake the world by reassembling images, uh, reassembling the, the media that we're exposed to. Uh, cultural convergence. Uh, the idea of cultural convergence is, is the idea that as media spread ideas, uh, not just within large societies, but, but across societies, uh, we have images from one society or another society that, that, that uh, start to be shared. So, <coughs> for example, uh, the characters created by Walt Disney uh, Corporation, um, uh, as those were distributed uh, through film and television uh, to bigger and bigger global audiences, uh, the images, uh, the, those images and characters started to appear uh, sometimes in the same way, sometimes in different ways in, in, the, in cultures that had not produced them. Uh, uh, Disney as a company uh, has a global print footprint and has for some time. Uh, uh, they have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they have um, not just uh, not just spread um, communication uh, uh, film and television uh, globally, but they they've got uh, theme parks that and toys and clothing uh, that are part of uh, global culture now. So for many, for many people, these kinds of examples are, are examples of cultures meeting and coming together around particular kind of uh, objects uh, that are shared, uh, not exclusively, but largely, uh, largely through mass media. Excuse me just a moment, please. Um, global convergence. <coughs> it's connected to the idea of cultural convergence. It refers to the impact of physically distant cultures on one another. Um, <coughs> Technological convergence. Uh, technological convergence refers to the ways that technologies start to blend together. Um, we'll watch a video in a couple of minutes um, that that refers that refers to this idea. But um, in essence, technological convergence. Um, looks at looks at the ways that technologies that may start as something distinct come to blend together and rely on one another uh, in ways that have some uh, cultural significance. Uh, and if we consider uh, the idea of organic convergence and economic convergence, uh, the ways that they blend together are, are, are quite significant. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave that idea 
for now, it's an idea that will come up in the video that we watch, um, and, and we'll also deal with it uh, throughout the term. Okay, I have a video that I want you to watch. Um, I do know that you usually take a break in the middle of class. Um, can you tell me uh, what what's your preference? Should we take should we take our break now, uh, or should we watch the video and take the break after? What should we do? Okay, Ken thinks we should take the break when I'm done. So uh, I'll ask you now to uh, copy and paste the link that's on the screen. Uh, can we do that? All right, I'll I'll copy and paste the link for you into the uh, into the text box since I see it's difficult to uh, to copy and paste it from our system. Okay. about the transformed media landscape and what it means for anybody who has a message that they want to get out to anywhere in the world. And I want to illustrate that by telling a couple of stories about that transformation. I'll start here. Last November, there was a presidential election. You probably read something about it in the paper. And there was some concern that in some parts of the country there might be voter suppression. And so a plan came up to video the vote. And the idea was that individual citizens with, with phones capable of taking photos or making video would document their polling places on the lookout for any kind of voter suppression techniques and would upload this to a central place and that this would operate as a kind of citizen observation, that citizens would not be there just to cast individual votes but also to help ensure the sanctity of the vote overall.
Right? So this is a pattern that assumes we're all in this together. What matters here isn't technical capital, it's social capital. These tools don't get socially interesting until they get technologically boring. It isn't when the shiny new tools show up that their uses start permeating society. It's when everybody is able to take them for granted. Because now that media is increasingly social, innovation can happen anywhere that people can take for granted the idea that we're all in this together. And so we're starting to see a media landscape in which innovation is happening everywhere and moving from one spot to another. That is a huge transformation. Not to put too fine a point on it, the moment we're living through, the moment our historical generation is living through, is the largest increase in expressive capability in human history. Now that's a big claim. I'm going to try and back it up. There are only four periods in the last 500 years where media has changed enough to qualify for the label revolution. The first one is the famous one, the printing press. Movable type, oil-based inks, that whole complex of innovations that made printing possible and turned Europe upside down starting in the middle of the 1400s. Then, a couple of hundred years ago, there was innovation in two-way communication, conversational media. First the telegraph, then the telephone. Slow, text-based conversations, then real-time, voice-based conversations. Then, about 150 years ago, there was a revolution in recorded media other than print. First photos then recorded sound, then movies, all encoded into physical objects. And finally, about 100 years ago, the harnessing of electromagnetic spectrum to send sound and images through the air, radio and television. This is the media landscape as we knew it in the 20th century. This is what those of us of a certain age grew up with and are used to. But there's a curious asymmetry here. The media that's good at creating conversations is no good at creating groups, and the media that's good at creating groups is no good at creating conversations. If you want to have a conversation in this world, you have it with one other person. If you want to address a group, you get the same message and you give it to everybody in the group, whether you're doing that with a, a broadcasting tower or a printing press. That was the media landscape as we had it in the 20th century. And this is what changed. This thing that looks like a peacock hit a windscreen is Bill Cheswick's map of the internet. He traces the edges of the individual networks and then color codes them. The internet is the first medium in history that has native support for groups and conversation at the same time. Whereas the phone gave us the one-to-one -one pattern and television, radio, magazines, books gave us the one-to-many pattern. The internet gives us the many-to-many -many pattern. Right? For the first time, media is natively good at supporting these kinds of conversations. That's one of the big changes. The second big change Right? is that as all media gets digitized, the internet also becomes the mode of carriage for all other media, meaning that phone calls migrate to the internet, magazines migrate to the internet, movies migrate to the internet. And that means that every medium is right next door to every other medium. Right? Put another way, media is increasingly less just a source of information and is increasingly more a site of coordination because groups that see or hear or watch or listen to something can now gather around and talk to each other as well. Right. And the third big change right, is that members of the former audience, as Dan Gilmore calls them, can now also be producers and not consumers. Every time a new consumer joins this media landscape, a new producer joins as well because the same equipment, phones, computers, let you consume and produce. It's as if when you bought a book, they threw in the printing press for free. It's like you had a phone that could turn into a radio if you pressed the right buttons. Right? That is a huge change in the media landscape we're used to. And it's not just internet or no internet. Right? We've had the internet in its public form for almost 20 years now. And it's still changing as the media becomes more social. It's still changing patterns, even among groups who know how to deal with the internet well. Second story. Last May, China in the Sichuan province had a terrible earthquake, 7.9 magnitude, massive destruction in a wide area, as the Richter scale has it. And the earthquake was reported as it was happening. Right? People were texting from their phones. They were taking photos of buildings. They were taking videos of buildings shaking. They were uploading it to QQ, China's largest internet service. They were Twittering it. Right? 
And so as the quake was happening, the news was reported. And because of the social connections, right, Chinese students coming, coming elsewhere and going to school, or businesses in the rest of the world opening offices in China, right, there were people listening all over the world hearing this news. The BBC got their first wind of the Chinese quake from Twitter. Twitter announced the existence of the quake several minutes before the US Geological Survey had anything up online for anybody to view. The last time China had a quake of that magnitude, it took them three months to admit that it had happened. Right? Now, they might have liked to have done that here, rather than seeing these pictures go up online. But they weren't given that choice, because their own citizens beat them to the punch. Even the government learned of the earthquake from their own citizens, rather than from the Xinhua news agency. And this stuff rippled like wildfire. For a while there, the top 10 most clicked links on Twitter, the global short messaging service, nine of the top 10 links were about the quake. People collating information, pointing people to news sources, pointing people to the US Geological Survey. The 10th one was kittens on a treadmill, but you know, that's the internet for you. <laughs> but nine of the 10 in those first hours, and within half a day, donation sites were up and donations were pouring in from all around the world. This is an incredible, coordinated global response. And the Chinese, then in one of their periods of media openness, decided that they were going to let it go, that they were going to let this, this citizen reporting flower. And then this happened. People began to figure out in the Sichuan province that the reason so many school buildings had collapsed, because tragically the earthquake happened during a school day, the reason so many school buildings collapsed is that corrupt officials had taken bribes to allow those buildings to be built to less than code. And so they started, the citizen journalists started reporting that as well. And there was an incredible picture, you may have seen it on the front page of the New York Times, a local official literally prostrating himself in the street in front of these protesters in order to get them to go away. Essentially to say, we will do anything to placate you, just please stop protesting in public. But these are people who have been radicalized because thanks to the one child policy, they have lost everyone in their next generation. Someone who's seen the death of a single child, right, now has nothing to lose. And so the protests kept going and finally, the Chinese cracked down. That was enough of citizen media. And so they began to arrest the protesters, they began to shut down the media that the protests were happening on. China is probably the most successful uh, manager of internet censorship in the world, using something that's widely described as the Great Firewall of China. And the Great Firewall of China is a set of observation points that assume that media is produced by professionals, it mostly comes in from the outside world, right? it comes in in relatively sparse chunks, and it comes in relatively slowly. And because of those four characteristics, they are able to filter it as it comes into the country. But like the Maginot Line, the Great Firewall of China was facing in the wrong direction for this challenge. Because not one of those four things was true in this environment. Right? The media was produced locally, it was produced by amateurs, it was produced quickly, and it was produced at such an incredible abundance that there was no way to filter it as it appeared. And so now, the Chinese government, who for a dozen years has quite successfully filtered the web, is now in the position of having to decide whether to allow or shut down entire services. Right? Because the transformation to amateur media is so enormous that they can't deal with it any other way. And in fact, that is happening this week. On the 20th anniversary of Tiananmen, they just two days ago announced that they were simply shutting down access to Twitter because there was no way to filter it other than that. They had to turn the spigot entirely off. Now these changes don't just affect people who want to censor messages. They also affect people who want to send messages. Right? Because this is really a transformation in the ecosystem as a whole, not just a particular strategy. The classic media problem from the 20th century is how does an organization have a message that they want to get out to a group of people distributed at the edges of the network, and here's the 20th century answer. Bundle up the message, send the same message to everybody. National message, targeted individuals, 
relatively sparse number of producers, very expensive to do, so there's not a lot of competition. This is how you reach people. Right? All of that is over. Right? We are increasingly in a landscape where media is global, social, ubiquitous, and cheap. Right? Now, most organizations that are trying to send messages to the outside world, to the distributed, you know, the distributed collection of the audience, are now used to this change. The audience can talk back. And that's a little freaky, but you can get used to it after a while, as, as people are doing. But that's not the really crazy change that we're living in the middle of. The really crazy change is here. It's the fact that they're no longer disconnected from each other. The fact that former consumers are now producers. The fact that the audience can talk directly to one another. Because there's a lot more amateurs than professionals. And because the size of the network, the complexity of the network, is actually the square of the number of participants. Meaning that the network, when it grows large, grows very, very large. As recently as last decade, most of the media that was available for public consumption was produced by professionals. Those days are over, never to return. Right? It is the green lines now that are the source of the freak. Which brings me to my last story. We saw some of the most imaginative use of social media during the Obama campaign. And I don't mean most imaginative use in politics. I mean most imaginative use ever. And one of the things Obama did, what they famously, the Obama campaign did, was they famously put up mybarackobama.com, mybo.com. And millions of citizens rushed in to participate and to try and figure out how to help. Right? And incredible conversations sprung up there. Right? And then, this time last year, Obama announced that he was going to change his vote on FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Right? He had said in January he would not sign a bill that granted telecom immunity for possibly warrantless spying on American persons. By the summer, in the middle of the general campaign, he said, I've thought about the issue more. I've changed my mind. I'm going to vote for this bill. And many of his own supporters on his own site went very publicly berserk. Right? It was Senator Obama when they created it. They changed the name later. Please get FISA right. Within days of this group being created, it was the fastest growing group on mybo.com. Within weeks of its being created, it was the largest group. And Obama had to issue a press release. He had to issue a reply. And he said, essentially, I've considered the issue. I understand where you're coming from. But having considered it all, I'm still going to vote the way I'm going to vote. But I wanted to reach out to you and say, I understand that you disagree with me, and I'm going to take my lumps on this one. This didn't please anybody, but then a funny thing happened in the conversation. People in that group realized that Obama had never shut them down. Nobody in the Obama campaign had ever tried to hide the group or make it harder to join, to deny its existence, to delete it, to take it off the site. They had understood that their role with mybo.com was to convene their supporters, but not to control their supporters. And that is the kind of discipline that it takes to make really mature use of this media. Media, the media landscape that we knew, as familiar as it was, as easy conceptually it was, as it was to deal with the idea that professionals broadcast messages to amateurs, right, is increasingly slipping away. In a world where media is global, social, ubiquitous, and cheap, in a world of media where the former audience are now increasingly full participants, right? in that world media is less and less often about crafting a single message to be consumed by individuals. It is more and more often a way of creating an environment for convening and supporting groups. And the choice we face, I mean anybody who has a message they want to have heard anywhere in the world, isn't whether that's the media environment we want to operate in. That's the media environment we've got. The question we all face now is, how can we make best use of this medium, even though it means changing the way we've always done it? Thank you very much. Говорят, скакалки для девчонок, мячики для малышей, Слушать советы старших не круто.
Okay. Um, usually, I, I, I like to use this video as, as a discussion starter. Um, given that we're uh, running a little late, I think we'll, we'll, we will use this as a discussion piece, but we'll do it probably primarily on the Facebook group, which uh, Ken will be setting up for us and um, see how that goes. Now, a, a couple things I'd like to say about this video. <clears throat> Number one, um, when people are doing history, the standard way of looking at history is to start at the beginning and move forward. Uh, that's what Shirky's done, um, but here I am <clears throat> showing a video um, that's focused on on the present um, first in our class. Uh, I do that really because we're living in this cultural period, in this cultural moment that's so important to Shirky right now. Uh, in order to understand the cultural moment, <clears throat> its significance, he takes us through a very brief history of the development of mass media in the 20th century. Now he's not focused on, he's not focused on who developed what or when or why or any of that sort of thing. He's focused on uh, how people use technologies and what that suggests for uh, their participation in society. Uh, that's his big concern about, about the Internet. He sees the, the Internet uh, as a communication technology that doesn't just allow but actually requires us to behave differently, to engage differently in society if we're going to be effective in society. Um, so uh, that's, that's a, a, a key issue. So, uh, as we move forward, let's let's think about that idea uh, a little bit. Now, I've got also uh, another a couple of other videos in this presentation. In the interests of time, I'm not going to show them. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to watch them right now, uh, but I will post them into the Facebook uh, group. And I think probably for the future, um, probably for the future, when I have videos. Or, or other material I want you to look at, I'll paste it right into the Facebook group uh, where we can, uh, you, you can have easy access to links. Um, so, so that will, will help us. Um, another video which I will ask you to watch a little bit later on, uh, it's, a, it's um, this, this video, it's called Video Killed the Radio Star. It's by a musical group called The Buggles. Um, they were, um, I won't say prominent, but they were active. They were active, uh, especially in the 1980s, early 1980s in the United States. Um, the reason I posted this here, it's a short video, it's kind of fun, but it, it illustrates the, uh, the, the obsession that many media have with media. Uh, this particular song, which was the first the first video aired on MTV, which was a, a brand new a brand new channel in a relatively new expanding medium, cable uh, cable television, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 is a commentary precisely uh, a commentary precisely on the disruptive influence, the the change that video was 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 already making uh, and was going to be felt more profoundly uh, in the music industry uh, and in, in culture more generally. So um, yeah, watch the video. It's kind of fun. And, and this is an idea, the idea that, that's part of that video. And I, I mean, watch it later, not right now. Um, the idea that's in that video is, is one that, that we will come back to from time to time in the course. There are a few more ideas to come out of this chapter that I, I want to call your attention to, and, and as you read the chapter, you can you can review them a bit. Um, I, I'm an American. I haven't lived in the United States for 25 years, uh, but but I was born in the U.S. I grew up there, um, and and of course that. Uh, 
you, you always retain that uh, identity of your, your home country. Um, free speech is uh, a cultural value that, uh, that I, I find that um, people from the United States hold very closely and, and, and assume also that it's closely held by, by others. It, I think it is a value that's held by many other people, but not in quite the same ideological uh, terms that it is uh, by Americans. This text is written by an American, uh, primarily for an American audience. Uh, and as you as you read the text, you keep that keep that in mind as you read it. Uh, the person who's writing is speaking to an American audience, and that's true because of the dominance of the United States in educational publishing industries. That's true of many texts that are used uh, in many different places in the world. Um, so. The idea of free speech, when we talk about free speech, uh, for Americans it often comes embedded in a, in a cultural uh, context uh, in which uh, free speech is, is embedded in the U.S. Constitution as part of U.S. law. Um, I hope this is an idea that you'll consider from your own cultural perspective and from other cultural perspectives as well. Uh, how, uh, look for ways that, that ideas that, that you encounter in the text connect with ideas and values that you're familiar with. How are they similar? Uh, how are they different? Because these are, I think these are important uh, points in understanding. Um, we talked a few minutes ago about the idea of uh, global uh, convergence, convergence between cultures. Um, this doesn't just mean uh, what's sometimes called cultural, cultural imperialism, the idea that dominant cultures uh, deliver messages, transmit messages to other cultures, and, and, and uh, that the, the less dominant cultures uh, absorb those messages. I think in, in an environment in which communication happens in two directions, um, and in any cultural milieu, um, cultural sharing uh, doesn't just uh, involve absorbing one culture, absorbing ideas from another culture. There's more of a negotiation, more of a sense of um, taking bits and pieces, taking the things that matter and are important, and maybe discarding the rest. So as you, as you go through the text, please consider um, when you look at different ideas, how they connect to your experience, to your knowledge of your own culture, to your knowledge of other cultures, um, because that will be significant in terms of how you might um, understand and apply the knowledge in the future. Uh, another important idea that will come up is the idea of propaganda. When we talk about communication as a, a tool for transmitting ideas, for sending information um, that helps us to focus also on the idea of uh, information as something that can be used to influence people uh, against their will. The idea of propaganda is the idea of a message that tries to persuade its audience for ideological, uh, political, or social purposes to manipulate them. Um, Communication scholars now don't see propaganda as something that works in such a simplistic way. Audiences do things with information, with ideas that they encounter. Uh, they aren't just uh, they aren't just influenced. Uh, they engage with ideas and. Uh, so something to keep in mind here is that the image that we have of propaganda, of information as something that can be directed at people and used to influence people psychologically, um, is something that emerged uh, during the broadcast era when, when people first encountered broadcasting. Um, it made people think 
there must be a way to use this new medium really to influence people, to get them to do what we want them to do. Um, and that idea uh, influenced a lot of thinking about uh, media for, for generations. Another idea we should look at is mass media as gatekeepers. Um, in an information environment where much of our information comes from uh, large communication companies, uh, newspapers, magazines, books, television, film, in that kind of a world, um, editors and producers of information play an enormously important role in uh, selecting what's important for us to see and making choices. And those choices influence what we understand about the world around us. The idea of a gatekeeper is the idea of somebody, somebody who stands by a gate and decides when to open it and let things through and when to close it to not let things through. Okay. This idea of the gatekeeper also strongly has influenced our understanding of uh, mass media and particularly the role of people working in mass media as people who make choices, hopefully good choices, to decide uh, what information is most important for us to know about. Um, Shirky's talk, this, this effect, this uh, ability is somewhat undermined or perhaps uh, completely undermined by the advent of the internet, which uh, increases the, the opportunity that people have individually to make choices about what they see, what they pay attention to, um, and also vastly increases the number of people making different kinds of choices about what to distribute. So no longer is there a small number of uh, people in communication industries making choices that influence everybody. Now everybody has some opportunity to play a role in the picking and choosing of information that gets distributed through the network. Uh, so this is another, another big ch uh, change uh, in, uh, in our, current, uh, our current cultural moment in mass media. Uh, another idea that's important, and a couple of other videos that I'll that I'll ask you to look at, I'll post them in Facebook later on, is uh, mass media as taste makers. Uh, now, <clears throat> this is an idea that it relates to the idea of, of gatekeepers also, but uh, in many ways, mass media have played a role in introducing people to things that they might consume, they might buy. Uh, the, uh, the example that I'm, uh, I give you in, in the links here, there was a show in the United States called The Ed Sullivan Show, very popular television program uh, in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, and this was a, a program that people working in the mu music industry, uh, uh, recording groups, uh, worked very hard to get onto because once you were seen on the Ed Sullivan show, it gave you an exposure uh, that really helped people's careers. And, and there were groups like uh, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, um, other uh, prominent groups of the 1950s, 1960s that were seen on Ed Sullivan and suddenly after they were seen on Ed Sullivan, uh, sales of records went up and they became international phenomena. So uh, that's just one example of the way that, that media become uh, taste makers. Uh, and you can see this throughout different industries uh, as well. Another idea that we'll, we'll touch on as we move through the course. Uh, we talk about uh, ratings here. I think I'll, I'll let you uh, I'll let you look at this in the in the textbook to uh, understand the idea a bit better so that we don't uh, go too much uh, over over time. Media literacy. Media literacy is an important idea that, that we'll we'll 
deal with throughout the course as well. Media literacy is the idea that um, when we watch, read, listen to media, we're doing work. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not just simply receiving. We're interpreting, decoding, processing, trying to understand messages. Uh, in an increasingly media-saturated society, a society in which we're bombarded with images, it's important for us to be able to understand the messages that we see uh, and, and to create messages of our own as well, whether for individuals or groups. Uh, media literacy refers to the process of being able to decipher to understand what we're seeing and hearing um, and, and interpret it in ways that help us sort out what's true from what's not true, what's useful from what's not useful, um, that help us make reasonable decisions, not to be influenced, not to be manipulated um, as propagandists would like to be able to manipulate, but, but to actually make make choices that reflect our own interests and experience um, and, and to be able to communicate with other people in a media environment or elsewhere, uh, communicate in a way that allows us to, uh, to control the messages we're given and not, uh, and not simply to be, uh, to be influenced uh, by them. Okay, so when we talk about me media literacy, a few concepts that are most salient. All media messages are constructed. That means somebody's putting these things together. Somebody who has, who has an idea that they want to get across. It's important for us to know something about who's constructing the idea and what they're trying to do. Uh, that's part of our process of interpretation. <clears throat> All media messages are constructed using a creative language with its own rules. Um, if we look at the uh, changes in video, in, in film and video over a hundred years and more, we can see changes in the construction of film changes in editing, changes in ways things are done. When you watch the Buggles video later on, Video Killed the Radio Star, please pay attention to the way the video is done when, and compare it to some of the videos you may have seen recently, music videos. Uh, the construction of the video is different. The editing is different. And this has a lot to do with how we interpret, uh, how we understand. Right? Understanding the construction of media messages is an important element to understanding the ideas behind them. Okay, number three, different people ex experience the same media message differently. In other words, who you are, what your experience is, what your interests are, what your concerns are, will have a lot to do with how you experience the media you encounter. This is an idea that works against the the idea of the predominance of propaganda. We aren't, people aren't simply passive observers who are influenced by media. People make choices, people interpret, people understand and uh, consider things. And the way I understand a particular media message may vary from what your understanding is or someone else's understanding is. All media have embedded, embedded values and points of view. The people creating media have values and points of view which they're trying to get across. In any conversation, there are values and points of view that may be shared or they may differ between the people involved in the conversation. The process of understanding is one of negotiating, of 
making choices about those differing values and points of view. This is part of what happens to us in the process of engaging with media. And finally, most media messages, professional media messages, are organized to gain profit or power. Um, political messages, television commercials. Um, we live in, in a society that's dominated by the pursuit of power and the pursuit of profit. Uh, and most media messages that we encounter will be engaged in some way in that pursuit. So that's another idea with media literacy. Okay, that's the last of the concepts that I wanted to introduce today. Um, as you read chapter one, uh, please think back to what I've presented here today. I know you didn't get a chance to read it before I did the presentation, so I, I hope that I hope that my presentation will help you select out some important ideas. There are other ideas in the chapter, um, and I would encourage you, because I don't have time to go over every idea, what I do is I select what I think are the most salient, the most useful ideas. Uh, I'd like you, as you read the chapter, when you encounter other ideas, keep them in mind. Feel free to ask questions, uh, raise issues uh, about them. Um, We'll take our break now. Uh, I believe Ken will come back uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes. So uh, if, I'm not sure if he's online now, but he was, he was going to come back at 45 minutes after the hour. Uh, please check back with him. Uh, I'll give you your break uh, now. But before I do that, uh, yeah, Ken says 10 minutes, please. Take a ten, uh, you'll be able to take a 10-minute break. Uh, if you have any questions for me right now, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, uh, when we get the Facebook group set up, that will be a place where you can ask questions. Uh, okay, Ken says he has 20 minutes more of uh, presentation to do. So you have a choice to make. You can either continue now with uh, his presentation for 20 minutes and then uh, he'll be done and you can end there, or you can take a break for 10 minutes and uh, he'll go for another 20. Uh, so say young, please let us know what your preference is. Okay, so long. Thank
Okay, as I said, we're, we're going to try to record all of these, so if you need to uh, review the, the class, you can watch the video, or if somebody misses the class, they can watch the video. Okay, um, so uh, again, my name is Ken Harvey, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and re review this uh, uh, video with you. As uh, First off, sometimes uh, uh, a lot of people have a hard time pronouncing my last name, uh, so I've been, probably most of my life I've been called Ken rather than uh, Harvey, Dr. Harvey, Dr. Ken, just Ken, whatever. Um, most of my background has been in, in uh, as a newspaper editor and publisher, and frankly, if I ever asked my colleagues to call me Dr. Harvey, they'd probably throw me out a window. Uh, it's, they're not, uh, uh, you know, at a newspaper, at a magazine, they, they're not accustomed to using formalities, let me put it that way. The uh, Basically, your score in this uh, class, your grade in this class, will be based on these uh, uh, various assignments. There, I'm anticipating, anyway, that there will be about 16 students, so not uh, like only half of you are here today, and so the other half hopefully will watch uh, this video. But uh, uh, so one part that uh, Frederick already mentioned is we do have a Facebook site. Uh, it is included both in the syllabus uh, and here uh, for your view. And uh, so if you don't have a Facebook account, you'll need to uh, sign up and then uh, come to this, uh, this site and interact with each other, uh, interact with us and with each other. So Frederick will post uh, some of those short videos. Uh, I think the videos that he's talking about are all, you know, in the, you know, two to five minute range, something like that. So uh, that won't take you long to watch those, but we want you to comment. Uh, it's worth 15% of your grade, and so I would anticipate that it's worth you going there and, and making some comment every week. It's basically 1% per week. So show up to the uh, Facebook site and interact with us and with each other. Uh, if somebody makes a comment, uh, one of your peers, one of the other students, or one of us you disagree with, then tell us you disagree and why you disagree. Or if, uh, or if you agree, you know, why you do agree. Whatever the case might be, but interact and share your ideas uh, that we're talking about in, in, uh, in Facebook. Uh, beyond that, uh, you'll also be, uh, make, each of you will make a presentation and we'll come back to that in a few minutes, but uh, it'll be a presentation based on one of the chapters. As you see, as you experienced today, Frederick uh, covered um, a good deal of, of chapter one. One of you will also take chapter one and you'll take a different perspective on it. Uh, you might uh, review, you know, might, uh, it, well, usually, usually, um, well, I was going to say usually you'd present before Frederick, but the way we're setting up this semester, he has a class later, so he will present first and then you will present. Uh, so look at it from your perspective. There may be some duplication between what you present and what Frederick presents. Uh, try to find some local perspective, perhaps. So uh, uh, this book is obviously written by an American, and... Uh, and so he has a very much an American perspective. And so as you do your presentation, uh, you, you'll be rewarded if you um, can find a Korean perspective and uh, take a, a little bit different look at it from what the book uh, uh, presents. Uh, you'll also have several uh, individual creative assignments, and we'll also review those in a few minutes as we proceed through the syllabus. Um, one will be, the first one will be a very quick uh, writing assignment, and uh, I'll, again, I'll go into detail on what I want you to cover in a second. And then there will be two video assignments. One is a team. We'll, we'll have you uh, uh, make, you know, create teams of about four people uh, per team, and uh, you'll create a video together. And again, I'll review that in a second, the subject. And then your last creative assignment will be to do your own video. And, uh, and we'll come back, back to that in a second. And then there will be a final exam. Most of that final exam will be comprised of 
questions that you are going to prepare. Uh, when you do your presentation, uh, you are to also create some multi, uh, multi multiple choice questions to go with it uh, and answers. And you will, uh, as the last part of your presentation, you'll review the multiple choice questions that you created and, uh, and the answers with, with us and with your, the fellow students. And uh, we'll compile all those questions or select some of those. Uh, if we have a few extra questions we want to add, we will uh, create those and distribute those ahead of time so that you uh, know what additional questions we might ask. And so you'll have at the end of the semester, you might have you know 200 questions to look at, and out of those, you might only choose 50. So that's in, in a sense, part of your learning process is that you will uh, review the questions, think about them, memorize the answers, and and everybody should get a pretty good grade in the final exam. So the final exam should be, in many ways, the easiest part because you'll be able to just you know again be uh, able to review all 200 or so questions that are developed ahead of time and uh, just take a little bit of time to make sure you understand what the answer should be. These are the chapters included in the book. The book, uh, the textbook, uh, I don't know if, uh, if Kim has already uh, made you aware of that, but anyway, I, in, the, in the syllabus, I do give you a link where you can download the book if it's not already being um, uh, provided in electronic format. Uh, so today, as, uh, as you experienced, uh, Professor um, Emmerich covered the, uh, the first chapter, Media and Culture, and again, one of you will also review that from, a, from your own distinct perspective. Um, and then we'll proceed again, both, we'll basically have two presentations on every chapter, one by Professor Emmerich and one by one of you. And so uh, what I'm going to be asking you to do, and if you are ready, if you can choose today, you'll have your first choice. So you'll, you'll be able to have a, a better selection if you can look at these and, and select which one you want to present. Obviously, whoever pre presents the first chapter, we'll be doing that relatively soon. If you could do it next week, that'd be great. If not, we'll do it uh, in, in the third class. Uh, that'll be up to whether somebody feels, um, you know, has the courage, enough courage and confidence that they could go ahead and prepare that for next week. Uh, if not, like I say, we'll wait till the third class. Um, uh, there will be some weeks when we need to have two presentations, therefore, to get, get caught to cover everything. If we end up with more than 16 students, I understood that we have 16. Uh, if we uh, uh, have more than that, then I'll create a couple more, uh, a couple more topics and provide the uh, information with, uh, on which they, they will be based. So uh, this was week one. We already experienced that. Um, You'll see in your syllabus, you'll have a live link here. This is just a, a copy of it. So this is not a live link here, but in the syllabus, you have a live link to the Facebook site. And uh, as was already mentioned, uh, Professor Emmerich will be posting uh, those videos. And so that will be our discussion for this first week uh, is uh, you'll review those uh, three, I think three videos, whatever there was, and, uh, and just make some comment on them. Uh, I have the dates mixed up because I was confused. As, uh, okay, I see we look like we may have 10 students. So um, we may not have presentations on everything. Uh, in fact, maybe if there's only going to be 10 students, then maybe we will skip uh, student presentations on Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 and just jump immediately to, chapter, to the chapters thereafter. And so you can choose among any of the uh, chapters, starting with uh, chapter three, and uh, and then we'll be right on schedule then with with student uh, presentation. So when we come back uh, 
So my dates are off. So next week we will be back. If somebody, um, let me see. So Frederick will be talking about media effects next week. Um, so like I say, we'll probably just skip that. We will not have a student presentation on that. So the first one will then be the following week, class three, basically. The date is wrong, but the, 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 it'll be class three regardless. And one of you will make a presentation on books. And then the next week, some will make a presentation on newspapers and so forth, as you, as you see in the syllabus. In week six, you see, uh, I see, I think this date would be back to normal. Um, so I think this is the right date. Um, we will have your first creative assignment due. Again, that's, um, I, again, I'll come back to that in just a second, but I believe it's a 200 word, a short 200 word essay, and I'll come back to that. Uh, that will be the first week when we have two presentations to make. Uh, possibly. It depends on whether what uh, these two uh, topics are selected. Since there are 16 chapters, we're not going to do two student presentations on, on chapters 1 and 2, so that basically means there's 14 chapters and 10 of you to choose. If there's 10 students, then there'll be, there'll be 10 of those chapters covered. So uh, this will be the, the schedule, um, presuming uh, that everything goes right, which almost never does. So anyway, so you can look forward though to your first creative assignment, uh, a short essay. That's going to be pretty easy for you to do, and I'll come back to that in a second. In week 10, uh, uh, around uh, I guess on May 11th, your second creative assignment will be due, and this will be a video that you will make as a team. And so, if some of you don't have experience, uh, creating videos, uh, you you'll be able to teach each other. So I expect your your teammates to you know, as teammates you'll help each other, uh, and work with each other, and teach each other as uh, in the process of, of creating uh, the the second creative assignment. Because in the the third creative assignment you'll be doing a video by yourself. Um, you see again we proceed with those chapters. Uh, nothing real exciting to cover there and then on uh, June 8th week 14 you'll have we'll have maybe some uh, final discussions uh, a final lecture some final discussions and um, a final survey and exam to wrap up that last class also on your uh, in your syllabus uh, you'll find these projects as I already referred to. So project one is uh, to write a short essay, 200 words, about how, how you think the media, including online media, will affect Korean society over the next 60 years of your life. Most of you, maybe not all of you, but a, a good share of you will, will last another 60 years. Uh, our life expectancy is, is growing. And uh, so we can presume anyway most of you will make it. So over the next 60 years, uh, that's quite a while, what's going to happen to the media? What, what's going to be like? And how will that affect your society and then your life uh, you know, as part of that society? Again, project two as a team. And I'll let uh, uh, Kim... Uh, take care of that, creating the, the, and if it doesn't work out exactly right, uh, like if there are 10 students, then you can have five in each team, that's fine. Okay, uh, I see that uh, uh, Kim says, yes, if, if you're from China or from a different country, you can also localize uh, your PowerPoints and tell us about how, uh, in your presentations, how, you know, from what it's like from your perspective, whatever the subject might be. So if it's about uh, books, um, again, when you're doing your presentation, you can um, make some reference to books in China. Uh, and same then with your, uh, with your essay. Uh, you can um, you know, write about how you think it will affect Korean society rather than, China, or rather Chinese society rather than Korean society. So yes. Whatever culture you, you live in, that's, that's fine. 
Um, ultimately, then, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, there, there is here and in your syllabus a uh, two links. One link is to some videos I I put together. I, I didn't I didn't make them myself. I just found them in, on YouTube. And I think every case actually in this in this uh, uh, set, I may be adding some of my own videos later. But in this set of videos, these are all from uh, different uh, from YouTube, and they. You know, go through some of the software that I use uh, in, in making video. Uh, Audacity for doing um, the audio portion is a good uh, audio editor. I do not know if they have a Korean version of it, uh, but since you uh, are all learning English, you can probably would be, be able to use the uh, English version of Audacity regardless. Anyway, it's a very good uh, audio editor. And uh, anyway, it goes through the, you know, Movie Maker is another one that you could use. You may have something you prefer. I'm not going to dictate which uh, video editing uh, software that you use, but uh, ultimately you need to produce a video. Um, I have an example of one that you can use. Um, again, that's another link on your syllabus. The, uh, this link is a video that I made. And uh, so anyway, you can just take a look at that and kind of see what I'm expecting. It doesn't have to have a lot of live video. I'd like maybe you know a little bit of live video, and you can have a little more or less as you might as you might choose. Uh, some of the videos that students made last year had quite a bit of of live video. Uh, every uh, every student in the team had a little piece of video in their team video, and then like this uh, example will will show you. Um, then a lot of it was based on exporting PowerPoints. You can do a save as and, uh, in PowerPoint and save it as a TIFF file and bring that into Movie Maker, whatever movie software you're, video software you're using. And, and then in that case, you're doing voiceover, and that's where I would use Audacity. Uh, in this example, I did use Audacity to do the voiceover uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the TIFF uh, files. So you can see that, see kind of more or less what I'm expecting by looking at that video. And your project three, uh, again, well, going back to project two a little bit, I want you to cover content. And so you're going to be, you know, you've got uh, uh, four people on your team or five people in your team, depending on how they're, they're split up. Um, uh, this says two teams. Actually, it was, I think, um, yeah, I was thinking four teams when I, when I thought we were going to have 16 uh, students. But whatever it comes out, about you know four or five people to a team. I cover about three of the chapters in the textbook, presumably the ones that you're going to be presenting. And so you just uh, take some of those chapters, and uh, you'll already have created a, or if you haven't created a PowerPoint yet on your chapter, you will. And so you can extract some of those, uh, or turn some of those PowerPoint slides into TIFF files and import those into your movie maker or your video editor. And uh, so it, it kind of overlaps with your presentation assignment also. And then finally, the, the Project 3, you'll be doing a video of your own, uh, just a, like a five-minute video. And this one uh, reflects back in Project 1. Uh, having, you know, taking, you'll be doing this project towards the end of the semester. And so now after participating in the class, you kind of take your 200-word essay and you kind of turn it into a video and update it a little bit. Now that you've had a chance to think about how media is changing and so forth, how it affects society, uh, your project three uh, should be, you know, should be somewhat different than your essay in project one. Because uh, hopefully you have learned some new things and gained some new insights. And so, um, and again, this one says that you don't have to use real video, you can. Uh, you can make it totally with slides, with PowerPoint slides, and do totally voiceover, voice narration over graphics if you choose to. Um, but, of course, if you want to do real video as well, that's great. Uh, that would be wonderful. We have... Um, This is not showing up, and I don't know why. Anyway, on your in your syllabus, maybe I failed to put it over. I guess I did. In my hurry last night, I failed to bring it over into the into the slideshow. 
but in your syllabus you have the uh, the critique sheet that I would use to grade your presentations. So yes, so do review that. Um, it, it tells you everything that I want you to do. Uh, you know what I'm going to be looking for as you do your presentation. It explains that I want you to do the multi, multi, uh, multi, multiple choice questions as part of your presentation and so forth. So do review uh, uh, the right criteria because, again, that's the basis for my grading. So that will be important for you to do. Okay, I want to go back and uh, let's have somebody trying to call me in the background, but they're just going to have to wait. Um, that one, I think. Um, okay, so here's the contents of the book. If you would like to uh, select one of these now, again, we're going to skip one and two. So if you want to uh, uh, select one of these now, uh, think about this, and you can just put it down uh, over in the uh, uh, in the chat section. You can say, you know, uh, I want radio, and it will actually tell me your name. So it's, uh, since all of you have signed in, uh, as you see, when you type something, it, it, it uh, puts your name in automatically. So if, any, if, if you'd like to choose a subject right now, then please do so. Um, and that's really all I wanted to cover today. And so you can stay as long as you want as far as deciding if you want to select a, a, a chapter to present. I would be particularly anxious to have one of you choose uh, chapter three. And so we know who's going to make the first presentation. So if somebody has the courage and confidence to do chapter three, then uh, uh, I would greatly appreciate you letting me know that now so that we know we have a presenter for, uh, for our week, for our week three, for, for our lesson, or our class three, we could say. Do you have any questions? Any questions for me? We promised to let you out uh, about an hour early. This is not quite an hour early, but uh, uh, we wanted to go ahead and cover that first chapter and uh, cover this syllabus. Again, any questions that you have for me? If not, we can go ahead and sign off. But if anybody wants to choose a chapter, I will keep. Uh, I will stay online, and so that uh, if any of you are choosing a chapter, I'll I'll have a record of that. Uh, who to expect to be ready in, in our third class to present the book chapter or whatever chapter that you happen to be choosing uh, in the appropriate week. Again, I'm recording this, so I will, it takes a little while to convert this into a uh, an AVI uh, video, in which case I will, after converting it, I'll upload it to YouTube and I will uh, send out a link to that. Uh, actually, I'll probably put it on YouTube and then I'll um, embed it into uh, a, a website uh, of my own where you can go see all the videos so you know exactly where to go because I'll embed all the videos on the same web page so it'll be easier for you to, to find them. So I will uh, um, have that prepared and uh, inform you as soon as I have the video ready for you to watch. Uh, most of you probably won't watch it again, but um, that uh, link can be passed on to those who missed this class. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, then we'll go ahead and finish for the day. Okay, yeah, go ahead and choose any anyone you want. You can choose uh, those now. And uh, or you can wait and choose them next week. We are yeah, next week. You'll have a chance to select again if you don't select now, but you have a better selection now. <laughs> if you wait till next week, then there'll be uh, another four students fighting for those for the best chapters, and uh, and of course, as soon as you select one, it's yours. Nobody else can take that chapter. It's all yours. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my microphone. Uh, it'll be, we're looking forward to this semester with you. And uh, so you can go ahead and put in the chapter names. I'm still online, but I'm going to go ahead and turn off my microphone. So thank you for joining our class. 
And we look forward to getting to know you better and, and uh, sharing ideas with you. there. Not there. 